So it's good to see everyone. My name is David Ewan, and I head up the Bravehearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Melly Martinez. You can like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at TRC413. You can subscribe to our YouTube page, which is ResSense Spring. We also have our radio stations, ResurrectionCenterRadio.com. Um, th we've got a lot of things. We've got the Europe edition of tonight's teaching. It's already there. Um, there's a lot that's going to be going on tonight, so we're sort of jumping in uh, a little bit early because tonight we're going to be discussing what I spoke with Pastor about uh, a few minutes ago. Is, is There's a difference between something called theology and divinity, okay? And first fruits is uh, a discussion that's in both theology and divinity. So what is theology? Theology is the academic understanding of what we learn in the Bible. What is divinity? Divinity is that which is orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so you've seen the posters. There it is on the wall. Um, we're going to be having our first fruit celebration on October 25th, 2020. Uh, notice I said the word celebration. Okay, so it's more than just an offering, it's a celebration. Now, we're going to be talking about why it's a celebration, okay? This year's First Fruit Celebration was going to be earlier in the year, but then COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic occurred. So it has been moved to October 25th, and that's a Sunday, and it's during our Sunday service. Uh, and it was interrupted because of the plans that had been put in place originally in April. So this year's celebration, and actually the date is much, much better um, in terms of its uh, divinity, its spiritual reasoning. And here's why. It more, more closely matches the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, in 2020 that began in the evening of Friday, September 18th. The Jewish New Year is the first of the Jewish holy uh, days specified by Leviticus, and that's in chapter 23, verse 23 thir through 32, that in occur in early autumn of the Northern Hemisphere. The current Jewish year is AM5780. You never heard anyone say AM. What's the AM all about? The AM stands for Eno in Latin, that means in the year of the world, and the abbreviation is AM. The year dating from the year of the creation of the Jewish chronology, the Jewish calendar, based on rabbinic calculations, we will celebrate on Sunday, March 25th at noon. Rosh Hashanah 2020 began in the evening of Friday, September 18th, and ended in the evening of Sunday, September 20th. Rosh Hashanah is the celebration of the Jewish New Year. On Rosh Hashanah, Jews from all over the world celebrate God's creation of the world. Rosh Hashanah marks the start of the Jewish High Holy Days leading up to Yom Kippur. It marks the beginning of the Ten Days of Awe, as it's referred to, in which Jews focus their attention on repentance and reflection. And it leads, uh, it's the Day of Atonement. It's considering the holiest day of the year. Yom Kippur 2020 began in the evening of Sunday, September 27th, and ended in the evening of Monday, September 28th. It is on Yom Kippur the Jewish are encouraged to make amends and ask for forgiveness for the sins committed during the past year. The holiday is observed with a 25-hour fast and a special religious service. This is why, because of the time of year, in the season of harvest. This is why October 25th makes much better sense to celebrate our first fruit harvesting and our offering. The only way, now I'm going to shift gears a bit, the only way you can really be ready to understand first fruits is you've got to know about tithes and offerings first. If I don't tell you about tithes and offerings first, then first fruits won't make sense, okay? Because... First fruits is something that goes beyond tithes and offerings. So, you, you know, you don't want to have the cart before the horse. So there's an order of things. So that's what I'm going to do. We'll, we'll first talk about tithes and offerings first, and next we'll talk about first fruits. Okay? That's what we're doing today. But I'm going to be talking about the theology. Okay? The academic understanding, so it makes sense. Next week, we're going to be talking about the divinity of first fruits. Okay, so that's why we're taking two weeks in this. 
Finally, you'll be an expert in all three. Today, we discuss the theology of first fruits. That is the academic understanding of first fruits. Next week, we'll talk about the divinity of first fruits, and that's the spiritual understanding. So I'm going to start off with a story. I'm going to start off with a story. Um, some of you know that I'm from a large family. I'm one of nine children. Uh, but one of my brothers is two years younger than me. And, you know, when I was yay high, when I was a little boy, um, my brother and I played in the sandbox. We had a sandbox. And w what we played with was our toy dump trucks. And he had blue and I had red. Both were the same other than the color. We could exchange, but he kept blue and I kept red. Mine is mine and his is his. The question is, which was beyond our comprehension back in those days, is who owned the trucks? Where did they come from? Well, what it was, it was a Christmas gift given out of love from our parents, very much like how God gives you blessings out of love. See, what happened, this is what actually happened on Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, my mother was sitting next to me, and I said, and I remember distinctly, and there's a reason why I remember it. I was like four or five years old, and I remember this. I said, where's my truck? And she said, now, I was sitting in an Indian style. My mother was sort of kneeling next to me, and she said, here it is, and she put her right hand on it. There it was, and it was right there in front of me. See, I don't know why I asked the question. I didn't even know that I was getting this dump truck for Christmas. It was something I assumed. For me, the truck was mine. It didn't matter who owned the truck, where it came from, but it was something that I wasn't expecting. I don't know what made me blurt that out. So this is the lesson decades later that I learned from that. We convert love, meaning the love from my parents, into assumed ownership. It's mine. It's a selfish conditioning of the mind, and it's developed when we are young. It's natural as it's part of our self-defense. It's part of our survival mechanism. The, the root source of this mechanism is good because as a humankind, we need to be able to survive. Okay, so I understand that. But as we get older and more mature, what we need to do is understand what is the gift. See, God gives us love by blessings, and we assume we own it through our own selfish desires. And that's where the dump truck story comes into play. Okay? Um, here's an illustration. Um, and I, I just shared this with Pastor a while ago and the folks in Europe couple days ago, so this is new information. What I'm about to say is not out of pride. I'm giving a testimony. I'm giving a testimony. Um, I'm also going to, as part of the testimony, I'm going to explain to you the way I used to be and the way I am now, okay? And as I share this testimony, think about the dump trucks. Um, so here's the, the illustration. I do two things at Harvard University. First, my team and I are creating a state holiday with the governor's office for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's something we're doing with Harvard University, okay? Um, I won't spend the time with it now, but that's, that's another testimony. That'll be a fun Wednesday night uh, next year. But that's something we're doing. Uh, second, I'm taking a course of study in theology for divinity at Harvard University. I graduated in early December from Harvard University. That's a fun secret. I haven't told anyone. Okay, now here's the old me and the new me. The old me, in a prideful say, would say, I worked hard, I paid for it, and I positioned myself to work with the governor's office for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and to be at Harvard University. I would say, I made that happen. That's the old way. That, that's not me today. That's the old me. The new me recognizes that God gave me an opportunity. Say opportunity. God gave me an opportunity for even greater blessings in the future. I owe God gratitude for the opportunity he gave me. Okay? So, I owe God gratitude. How do I pay for it? If I want to give gratitude, how do I pay for it? I'll tell you how it's done. It's done through character and integrity. And that's why we're covering our topic tonight. We're going to talk about how we give God our gratitude through your character and integrity. 
Say character and integrity. That's the big topic for tonight. The Bible teaches us biblical principles specific to character and integrity. Again, it's character and integrity. Let me break it down for you. I'm going to take a little, and you're going to hear me repeat a lot. Um, for those that are arriving, we've given out a, pa uh, a handout, um, and we'll put, post it on Facebook, uh, but our studio audience has a parting gift. Um, character is an offering. It's related to the behavior towards giving. That's what an offering, it's a behavior towards giving. Okay? Integrity relates to tithing. That's obedience to instruction. Let me break that down again. Character is related to the offering, which is the behavior towards giving. Integrity is the tithing. That's the obedience towards instruction. More will be explained soon. I'm not going to end there, okay? Tithes and offerings are different. They are not the same, okay? There is an order that we'll also talk about later, but I'll introduce now. Tithes is number one. It's given first. Offerings is number two. It's given after. Tithes comes before offerings. Offerings come after tithes. There's an order. That's a biblical principle. So let's start simple. Let's begin with tithes. A tithes is a specific amount. It's a measurable amount. You can use your calculator on your phone. It's actually something that is calculated. It's 10% of your net income, not gross income, your net income. What I mean by that is after taxes, for example. It's the 10% of your income that you give first, and an offering, if you call it an offering, is anything beyond, above and beyond the tithes, okay? I'm going to read to you Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all your fields produced each year. Okay? Be sure to set aside a tenth of all your fields produced each year. When you read the Bible and it talks about tithes and offerings, you will see that it is speaking to an audience of an agricultural-based society. We have to, when we read the Bible, we have to be mature in a way that we translate what that means. We convert the farm field to our bank account because what we harvest is what's in our bank account. That's what our jobs are, okay? So Deuteronomy, be sure to set aside a tenth of, the, uh, uh, I'll say it again, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Notice I said each year. Notice that's once per year, okay? We do that a little bit differently now. This is a biblical principle that is different from an offering. It's a biblical principle that's different from an offering. I haven't even talked about offering yet. Tithing is the first 10%, and an offering is what comes after that. It's above and beyond that. It's not the same, okay? An offering alone meaning an offering without a tithe, that's what I mean when I say an offering alone, is not a biblical principle. Okay? Let me say that again. I'm not talking about an offering. I'm talking about an offering alone. That's not a biblical principle. Because an offering is what comes after a tithe. So the tithe has to come first before an offering. I'm going to explain that. So without the tithe, there is no offering. Imagine a broken-down car without a tow truck. The car is dead. The car is dead without the tow truck. An offering, in terms of biblical principle, is dead without the tithe. An offering alone is ignorance of the biblical principle because a tithe comes first and an offering comes second. And I'm going to explain that later. It's that simple. Payment of a tithe, did you notice I changed the language? I said payment. See, when, when we receive tithes and offerings unto the Lord, we don't use the word payment. But I'm using the word payment 
so that you can visually represent the activity. Because what it really is is bringing a harvest unto the Lord. That's what we do. When, when um, I stand over here, you see me you know, processing the credit cards. You see a basket here. There's cash and checks here. Okay, um, that's bringing a tithe or an offering unto the Lord. You're blessing the Lord. Okay, but I say the word payment just so you draw a picture in your mind. Okay, so payment of a tithe is an obligation. Say obligation. See, we read in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, Malachi uh, chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, where Christians are required to give 10% of their income to God through the church. It is faithfully adhered to. The act is to attract rich blessings from the Lord. This is also confirmed in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. So let me tell you those scriptures again. This is a lesson on tithes, and we're going to read this later. A lesson on tithes can be found in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, and Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. Now you have a guide for tithes. We'll talk about Malachi later. Now, tithing is a form of obedience because it shows you trust God. See, you have two choices. Do you trust money or do you trust God? Now, thousands of years ago in an agricultural society, the priest of the house would say, do you trust your farm fields? Or do you trust God? Okay? And so what happens with the tithes, when you give your first 10% to the priest of the house, you bring it unto the Lord, that is an act of obedience. It's an act of obedience and understanding that you trust God and that everything else will follow. That you do not need to trust the farm field. You do not need to trust the paycheck. You do not need to trust the bank account. Again, tithing is an act of obedience. Worship, here's the other word, worship, on the other hand, is ministry unto the Lord. We've talked a little bit about this. Worship, on the other hand, is ministry unto the Lord. You cannot minister to the Lord with your money. You cannot minister to the Lord with your money. God doesn't need it. He needs your obedience. That is what God is looking for. Okay, tithing ensures that our needs will be met and gives back to God what was always his. Remember that story about the dump truck? I never owned the dump truck. I didn't pay for the dump truck. I was in what was referred to as an assumed ownership. Understandable, I was about four or five years old. But it's good that I remember that and I can carry the lessons decades later. Okay? So again, tithing ensures that our needs will be met. And what we're always doing is we're giving back to God what was always hid. When we're born into this world and the doctor slaps your butt and you start crying, you have nothing. You don't have money. You don't even have clothes. And then you're bundled up. You didn't buy it. So everything you start off from the time you are born, you actually start with nothing. No clothes, no shoes, no job, nothing. So everything from that point forward, God has given to you. So when God is honored, it's because we are faithful. Let's talk about disobedience. That's when everyone's running out the door. (laughs) Let's talk about disobedience, okay? Why not? Why not talk about disobedience? No surprise there, okay? It's what people do. No surprise there. See, if you don't pay a tithe, oh, there we go. If you don't pay a tithe, the Bible says, and I'll read it to you, the Bible says you are robbing God and you are under a curse. I think people just kind of looked around. Is he talking to me? I'm going to read that again. If you don't pay a tithe, the Bible says you are robbing God and you are under a curse. Say curse. This curse cannot be removed by your good works or your good looks or the fact that you're born again. You can only reverse this curse 
if you start paying the tithes. We talked about what that was. Tithes is the only key to prosperity and God's blessing. The book of Malachi teaches us that. Now I'm going to read Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. So if you're physically able, please rise as I read Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 or 10. 8 through 10. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. And then after I read that, I will read the other scripture that I shared with you, which is Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. So allow me to read this. Again, uh, I'm starting off with Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. And the scripture reads, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me on this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. And that is in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. I'm going to switch over to Leviticus. I'm in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. Again, it's Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. And the scripture reads, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belong to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of the value to it. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. If anyone does make a substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. These are the commands of the Lord gave Moses at Mount Sinai for the Israelites. And again, I was reading Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. Okay? So we've chatted a little bit about ties. Okay? Have a seat. Yes. I saw, oh, he's finished talking. Yes, have a seat. Oh, and you at home, have a seat. Now we'll talk about an offering. Okay, we're going to talk about an offering. Remember we talked about tithes and it was a measurable thing. You heard me talk about 10%. Well, here's what an offering is. In an offering, we get that from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. And I'll read the scripture. It says, each of, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Notice I didn't say 5% or 2% or $3. It's what's in your heart to give and that God loves a cheerful giver. Tithing is the first 10%, and an offering is what is after and beyond the 10%. It's not the same. And you remember we talked about an offering alone is like a car without a tow truck. It's dead because the biblical principle is the tithe. And the offering follows that. An offering alone, without the tithe, that's not the biblical principle. Okay? Okay? Now, remember, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. You know, I like Deuteronomy because it's a short scripture. It's an easy one to remember. It's a good one to sort of define what a tithe is. So again, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 says, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Now, we're not farmers, okay? We perhaps have a job or some sort of income, and our, our farm fields is our bank account, okay? So as I mentioned before, what we do is we convert. We convert the notion of farm fields and apply it to bank account, Okay? Um, Deuteronomy 14.22 talks about tithes. 2 Corinthians 9.7, chapter 9, verse 7, that talks about offerings. 
So now there are two scriptures you have that sort of separates the difference between tithes and offerings. And remember, we learned that the tithes are explained more in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, and Leviticus chapter 27, uh, 30 through 34. Now, I'm repeating a lot of these scriptures multiple times, but I've also passed out a handout for you because I'm saying a lot of things, but I need to back it up with scripture. If I just say it without scripture, then obviously I don't know what I'm talking about. But see, it doesn't matter whether or not I know what I'm talking about. What matters is the word is the word, and so I use the Bible, and I'm driven by the Holy Spirit. That's what happens at this altar, okay? So we talked about for tithes, it's explained in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, and Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. An offering is better understood in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. We read that to you. Now I'm going to go back to what I talked about in our introduction. Character and integrity. Okay, we've talked about tithes. We talked about offerings. Now let's connect it to the words of character and integrity. So a tithe is a specific amount, 10% of your income that you give first. An offering is anything extra that you give beyond that. We've talked about that before. Character comes from your offering. It is what's in your heart. Integrity comes from your tithing. You are entrusted with the principles to follow. It's what determines your trustworthiness. It's obedience. That's what develops trustworthiness. It's your obedience. So a review of tithes and offerings as it relates to character and integrity. Character is an offering. Integrity is a tithe. Okay? Character is an offering. Integrity is a tithe. So an offering reflects your character. Obedience to tithes shows your true integrity. We talked about character can be better understood in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, because that's the offering. Integrity can be understood with Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, because that's the tithe. Okay? And again, become a tithing expert by looking at Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, and Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. As a slight digression that's appropriate at this time, here in the United States, charitable donations are tax deductible, and the IRS considers church tithing tax deductible as well. Okay? And... Um, you can apply that to what is referred to as Schedule A, which is itemized deductions. So it is a tax write-off, um, and it's on your Schedule A, which is itemized deductions. Uh, what we also do is we give you a receipt for those that are here and for those that make payments online. Um, in cash, you save the envelopes. We save the envelopes. Take your phone. Take a picture of it. There's your receipt. So put cash uh, in your envelope and take a picture of, of it. Um, your check, if you write a check, there's your receipt. And by card, you may have seen me when I stand over here. I always ask you for your phone. So we're texting you the receipt. Okay, now we know about tithes and offerings. Now we can talk about first fruits. I had to talk about tithes and offerings first before we talk about first fruits, because first fruits is, we're going to talk about it's a celebration. So it's a little bit more than just an offering, it's a celebration. Um, and it's a different type of offering, it's prophetic. So it's a prophetic celebration. And that's why we do it once per year. Okay? So we're going to talk about some of that detail now. So what is first fruits in the Bible? Remember, we, we use the Bible, okay? Um, the book of Exodus narrates how Moses led the Israelites in the building of the tabernacle. That's in Exodus 35 through 40 with God's instruction. That's in Exodus 25 through 31. Then in the book of Leviticus, God tells the Israelites and their priests how to make offerings in the tabernacle and how to conduct themselves while camped around the Holy Ten Sanctuary. Let me break it down. The book of Exodus talks about the people. Right? The book of Exodus talks about the people. The book of Leviticus talks about the instructions. So the book of Exodus, you want to learn about the people. 
and the book of Leviticus, that's how you learn about the instructions. See, the book of Leviticus is the third book in the Old Testament and of the Torah as well. It contains a record of God's installing of a priesthood developing the church. Um, it's for uh, God's nation and giving them a biblical set of principles that would enable them to maintain holiness in God's eyes. Not their own prideful eyes, but in God's eyes. Okay, and I'm going to read a scripture. I'm going to read Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. But before I do that, let me give a definition of what a sheaf is because I read about a sheaf. Uh, it's a bundle of grain stalks that are laid lengthwise and tied together with some sort of a twine, and it's after the harvesting, after reaping, okay? Um, and so Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10 says, When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. That's in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. Did you hear me say first fruits? See, now we're getting into it. See, the concept of first fruits is rooted in biblical times. That means agricultural times. It's when people lived in an agricultural society. Harvest time was significant because that was when the hard work the farmers did, they, they had poured into the crops all year, it began to pay off, and they were literally reaping what they sowed. And that's why you hear that phrase, reap, you reap what you sow. Okay, again, a lot of the conversation, the discussion you read about in the Bible, it's from an agricultural society. So God called his people to bring their first yield, their first yield, the first early portion of the harvest, the first fruits. This was to demonstrate the Israelites the obedience, the trust, and the reverence of God. Back then, there were plenty of rules associated with making first fruit sacrifices. They had to be brought to the temple priests. No other, I'm going to read this twice. I'm going to tell you something. No other crops could be harvested until the first fruits were presented. Listen to that. No other crops could be harvested until the first fruits were presented. It was a very complex process. That is why it evolved into something that was ceremonial. Okay, so... That's why, as, as you see right here on the wall, first fruits, this is actually a ceremony that we're conducting. It's not just an offering. We're going to be conducting a ceremony, okay? The Hebrew word for first fruit is bikram, bikram. It's literally translated to promise to come. Did you hear me say promise to come? That means it's pr prophetic. So what have we learned about first fruits? And I haven't even talked very much about first fruits. It's a ceremony, and it's prophetic. So what we're going to be doing on October 25th is we're going to be having a prophetic ceremony. That's why it's exciting. The Israelites saw these first fruits as an investment into their future. God told them that if they brought their first fruits to him, he would bless all that came afterwards. God told them if they brought their first fruits to him, he would bless all that came afterwards. And that is why, as I mentioned before, no other crops could be harvested until the first fruits were presented. Then anything that came after the first fruits would be blessed. That's the idea. Okay? So first fruits is a prophetic offering. Now, earlier we talked about, see, I'm going to put all the pieces together now. We talked about how tithes relates to integrity. That's the trust and the obedience. Um, offering relates to character. That's your behavior, okay? Now you know first fruits is a prophetic offering, and it's a ceremony. That's how the three are different. Tithes, offerings, and first fruits, they're not the same. Okay, let's talk about first fruits in the Bible. I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. A lot of scripture tonight, huh? Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. It's a recognition that all that you have belongs to God. 
We see the term first fruits initially mentioned in the book of Exodus when Moses is leading God's people out of captivity in Egypt. You know the story. God instructed the Israelites, this is Leviticus, the instructions, God instructed the Israelites to give up the first of their crops so that they could understand the value of God's blessings. Remember, we talked about Exodus is about the people, Leviticus is the instructions, okay? Through the first five books of the Bible, Moses brings up the idea of, uh, of first fruits, that is, a total of 13 times. That's because it was an essential concept for his people to understand. It was part of the survival, but the survival was the reliance on God. The survival was not the reliance on the, uh, the harvest it, or the money, as we would call it today. First fruits is mentioned throughout the Old Testament, and it's even mentioned in the New Testament, it's not just an Old Testament thing. In the, New, in the New Testament, the term first fruit takes on a symbolic meaning. That's because the world had evolved. The communication was a little bit different. The Apostle Paul wrote to demand a higher ethical and moral set of standards. We've been talking about the book of Timothy. Remember that? It's uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy um, and and so we were talking about the ethical and moral standards. So the Apostle Paul also used a metaphor for first fruits. He was writing to the church of Corinth, an ancient city in Greece. Um, it's in the south central part of Greece. Uh, the remains of the ancient city lie about 50 miles uh, west of Athens. So that's the idea of where it is. I always have to look at a map and see where everything is. Um, let me read to you 1 of Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 through 22. Again, it's 1 of Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 20 through 22. And the scripture reads, But Christ was in, has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all all will be made alive. You see, Jesus was God's first fruits, his one and only son, and the best that humanity had to offer. God gave Jesus, who was raised from the dead, up for us in the same way that we, as a church body, sacrifice to give the best we have for God. We no longer live in an agricultural-based society. You likely don't have to worry about harvest time or giving away the first yield of your crops. But the idea of first fruits is still relevant. That's why we have to understand how the Bible is writing to an agricultural society, but we have to be mature enough to understand in the year 2020 that we relate the crop fields to our bank accounts. Okay, It just takes on a new meaning for us, that's all. Uh, Aside from that, the Bible never changes, as, as God's words uh, is, it never changes. Our first fruits has moved from an agricultural type platform to a modern day harvest, the financial harvest, the bank account. Today you sow your seeds to reap a financial harvest in your bank account. That is the farm you manage. Now, let me step back and chat with you a little bit about tithing and, again, and there's a reason why I'm pulling in tithing again. Uh, the difference between first fruits and tithing. Ezekiel's ministry was conducted in Jerusalem and Babylon in the first three decades of the sixth century. He held that each man is responsible for his own acts. As a prophet, he focused on the responsibility as it relates to the future. Be responsible for your acts today, and that will determine your future. Be responsible for your acts today, and that will determine your future. Before the first surrender of Jerusalem, the first surrender, he was, functioning, he was a functioning priest and prophet. Again, we're talking about Ezekiel. He was among those deported to Babylonia. The town of Babylon was located along the Euphrates River in the present-day Iraq. So I'm going to read Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30. And the scripture reads, The first of all your first fruits of every uh, one of your contributions, I'll say it again. The first of all your first fruits of every kind and every contribution of every kind from all your contributions shall be for the priest. You shall also give to the priest the first of your dough to cause a blessing to the rest of your house. And Ezekiel 44, 30. 
first fruit offerings are typically an annual gift, just like we're doing it this year, October 25th. It's an annual gift to the church done at harvest time. We talked about bickerum. Because we're not actually harvesting crops, the harvest can mean different things to different people. Perhaps you just got a bonus at work. Maybe you just received a huge tax refund check. Maybe you save 15% or more on car insurance by switching to Geico. <laughs> I, th I thought I'd slide that in there. <laughs> I had to. I, I, I saw an opportunity. I just had to slide that in. <laughs> See how that one worked. These are all harvest time moments when your hard work pays off. These are also great opportunities to turn back to God in gratitude for the blessings. Whenever you decide to make a first fruit offering, the important thing is that you do it freely with no guilt or obligation. This is supposed to be a celebration of all that God has done for you. It's a kind of worship that you can use to support the work of others. A first fruit offering is our opportunity, our, our church body, an opportunity to give above and beyond the regular tithe. So why is why is first fruit so very important? Making a first fruit offering opens us up to allow God to work in our life. Isn't that what we want? Okay. When we approach God with open hands rather than clenched fists, it makes it easier for God to give us more to work with. Giving of our first fruits reminds that God is our ultimate priority. It's not our money. It's not our bank account. It shows God that we are obedient to him and that we can be trusted with more. Perhaps the most important thing about this is being generous in this way shows that we are grateful for God and what he has given us. First fruits are an offering to God of the increase in income that we receive. Notice we're talking about the increase in income, not an overall amount. Specifically, first fruits is the portion of that increase. Fruits are your blessings from God. That is your harvest. First fruits is the first portion of that harvest. What you give to God acknowledges that what you have is from God. That is why we give our first fruits. The motivation of first fruits is a free will offering that we offer out of our generosity. It shows that we're not in love with money, and we are grateful. We are grateful to God as the ultimate source of the increase that we have in our lives. Offering first fruits when we receive an increase is a demonstration of our faith in God as the true source of our provision. Remember, when we consider what faith is, we need to acknowledge that faith is an action word. James, in the book of James, James said that unless faith produces action, it really isn't faith at all. I'm going to read James chapter 2, verse 17. James chapter 2, verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, it's dead. Remember the tow truck? The first fruit offering is one way to activate our faith in God as our provider. See, we, we pray to God for favor and provision. First fruits giving is an expression of three things. Gratitude, dedication, trust. Gratitude, dedication, trust. Gratitude is the acknowledgement that everything comes from God. Right. Dedication is declaring this and everything that follows belongs to God. That means the first fruit and everything that follows belongs to God. Trust is expressing faith in God's continued provision. We trust God. We don't trust money. So how to give a first fruit offering? That's in Romans chapter 11, verse 16. Romans chapter 11, verse 16. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And that's in Romans chapter 11, verse 16. So what does this practically look like? How do you determine how, when, and how much you should give as the first fruit offering? Well, this is going to look a little bit different for each person in each season, okay? The process of giving above your normal tithe can help prepare you for God 
to make a difference in your life, a positive difference, an increase. And when we talk about a difference, when God makes a difference in our lives, we're talking about an increase. That's why this is a prophetic offering. Making a first fruit offering demonstrates obedience to God rather than your money. First fruits are a tangible offering. It's a concept that is honorable and holy to God. By offering the first portion of our increase to God as a first fruit offering, we move the entire increase out of the world's cursed system and into the kingdom of God for as long as it continues. You see, in the spiritual realm, once we make a portion of that increase holy by offering it to God, we have, in fact, made the entire increase holy. So here's God's promise for the first fruits. Not only does the first fruits offering move the entire increase that we receive into blessings of the kingdom of God and out of the world's cursed system, but it also comes with an important promise. And I'll read that in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. Again, that's Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. And the scripture says, Honor the Lord with your possessions, with your first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, obviously, this promise was written in an agricultural society. I don't know about you, but I don't have any barns or wine presses to overflow with new wine. So what do the verses mean to us today? Well, centuries ago, barns were the storage areas for people to save up provision. For most of us today, the place where we uh, store our provision, it's our bank accounts. So that means the first fruit offering will help ensure our bank accounts will always be filled with plenty of provision. When you think about it, these promises make sense. Our first fruit offerings demonstrate that we can be trusted with money because we don't love it. We love God. We don't love money. When we love money, I see an insane. It's idolatry. Okay? That's next week. Ne this week, we talk about the theology of first fruits. Next week, we talk about the divinity of first fruits. Proverbs says that we are honoring God with our first fruits. Therefore, since we can be trusted to be good stewards over our finances, God can keep income flowing to us knowing it will be handled responsibly. So let's talk about what we're, we did today. We, d we did a lot of things today, okay? Um, today we talked about theology, okay? That's the academic understanding of first fruits. So I sort of laid out the land for you today. Next week, we're going to talk about the divinity of first fruits. That will be the spiritual understanding of first fruits. We learned about tithings and offering and how it relates to character and integrity. Once we got that out of the way, we talked about first fruits by giving history to it and applied the meaning to today's understanding. You know, we, we talked a lot, and I'm excited to share this with you because, as I said, the first fruits are prophetic, and it's a celebration. So on October 25th, um, we took a while to make that, that poster. I can imagine Pastor Millie said, wait, l let me straighten my hair. And then Pastor Millie says, wait, I don't have heels. Pastor Jose, you've got to kneel down a bit. And see, that's why Pastor Jose has that look. But <laughs> three days later, we got a picture. There you go. But I'm excited. I'm excited uh, because Pastor Jose, as the senior priest of the house, will be orchestrating this great celebration. Um, and I remind uh, the folks that are watching uh, at home uh, that our website is www.resurrectionspringfield.org. You can like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TRC413. Uh, you can subscribe to ResCent Spring on YouTube. Uh, we have the K-Radio. We have K-Television. Uh, perhaps the easiest one to remember is ResurrectionCenterRadio.com. Uh, My name is David Ewan, heading up the Bravehearted Ministry here at the Resurrection Center. It's good to see you. My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center.